oh, uh, hey, didn't, uh, <laughs> didn't, uh, didn't see you there. Okay. Now listen. We've spent a lot of time talking about Ukraine on this channel. With the failure of the Russian army and the constant shifting of objectives, Putin is currently looking about as silly as that actress who tried to become his mother on the internet. Dear President Vladimir Putin, I'm so sorry that I was not your mother. But as we watch the birth of a new genre of selfies with mangled Soviet tanks in the background, classic military errors such as the building of pontoon bridges whilst apparently ignoring the abundance of enemy anti-bridge technology on the other side, many people are asking the question, why only Ukraine? Is that the only part of the world where people are suffering? Where's your Yemeni flag? You're not racist against Arabs, are you? Oh, you have a Yemeni flag? Well, <laughs> where's your Ethiopian flag? Are you racist against Africans? Do you even have the flag of the Rohingya Muslims, twitter.corn? Now maybe this criticism isn't completely invalid. If someone said the abundance of Ukrainian flags on Twitter was the result of some kind of implicit racial bias, um, I'm sure there's an argument there. But I also don't think the average person should be expected to make a big noise about every injustice on earth just because they've chosen to speak about one. And I definitely wouldn't make the leap in assuming that just because someone speaks about one injustice then they must mean the other ones don't matter. That said, it is easy to see how oppressed people around the world might look at all the attention being devoted to Ukraine and feel like they've been somewhat ignored. Now, personally, I don't have the time or the brain to responsibly cover every issue around the world, but I can at least start somewhere. So for today, let's talk about Palestine. Now, when you bring up a topic like this, it's difficult to know where to start. The common impulse is usually to start with a big background of historical context and then build your political discussions around that. But when you start that way, there's always this habit of going into an infinite regress. Do we start with the formation of the State of Israel in 1948, which involved the ethnic cleansing of nearly a million Palestinians? Do we mention the Jews who were kicked out of East Jerusalem by the Jordanians shortly afterwards? Or what about the attacks on Palestinians by Zionist paramilitaries in the 30s and 40s? Or the anti-Jewish pogroms across historic Palestine in the 1920s? The Balfour Declaration in 1917, which conveniently omitted political rights and self-determination for Palestinians? the migration of Jews to Palestine after the 19th century pogroms in Europe, and eventually we end up back at the Jewish-Roman wars in the 1st and 2nd century which ended with the Jews either fleeing the region or being sent away on slave ships. In the end, it becomes all the more tempting to give in to that classic defense mechanism and concede that it's complicated. I'm sorry, do you know what's happening in Israel? Of course, bro, I read yes. the newspaper. Oh, okay, well, you know what, why don't you uh, crack an egg and knowledge all over me? Okay, okay. can I start? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, okay, there's a war on terror, Charlie. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen CNN? But just because some aspects are complicated, that doesn't mean all of it is. Contemporary narratives on the Palestinian cause, this video included, will often get accused of being one-sided, but I would argue that's because what we're dealing with is a very one-sided situation. You don't need an extensive background to know that what we currently have is a state using the weight of international support to carry out a decades-long military occupation, sieges, the bombing of dense civilian areas with white phosphorus, counting calories to limit food imports during the Gaza blockade, 42% of children in the Gaza Strip suffering from moderate or acute PTSD levels, f***ing hell, mass evictions, bombing of water and sewage supplies, things that no amount of historical context can really excuse. Now, I can't summarize the entire situation for you, but hopefully this video can give you a good enough understanding of what's happening right now, and what you, as a presumably Western audience, can do about it. For now, let's start with a debate that was brought into the mainstream fairly recently. The question of apartheid. In January 2021, the Israeli human rights organization B'Tselem published a report where they described the state of Israel as a regime of Jewish supremacy from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. In a word, apartheid. This set off a chain reaction of major international human rights organizations publishing their own pieces shortly afterwards, with the accusation of apartheid being echoed in reports from Amnesty, Human Rights Watch, and the UN. 
The B'Tselem report definitely signaled a turning point in the international discourse around Israel, but to call it groundbreaking would be kind of insulting. B'Tselem were far from the first people to ever accuse Israel of apartheid. Palestinians and even some Israeli activists have been making this claim for decades. In 2001, a lawyer called Raji Surani went to the UN Conference on Racism and described Israel as a racist apartheid state. To which the UN High Commissioner, Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch all said, Ooh, uh, golly, I uh, ooh, don't know about that one, boss. But now that these organizations have changed their tune, that will make it a bit harder for Israel's allies to mask their hypocrisy. For example, when the US State Department happily cites Human Rights Watch and Amnesty reports as credible sources on the atrocities in Ethiopia, well, they're going to have to come up with a pretty good reason to contest the same organizations when they talk about Israel. Now, there have been and still are objections to the accusation of apartheid, a lot of which are fairly easy to write off as blatant attempts to downplay the actions of the regime, but there are a few arguments that I think can be taken in good faith. One of these objections comes from a place of academic accuracy. For example, historians will be extra picky with words like apartheid, which they consider to be anachronistic. Apartheid is the Afrikaan word for apartheid, which described the white supremacist regime in South Africa and Namibia from the late 40s to the early 90s. They might not object to you making comparisons to apartheid, but if you want a label for the state of Israel, you'd have to use something different. In fact, some people have argued to use the word hafrada, the Hebrew word for separation which describes Israel's segregationist policies in the occupied Palestinian territories. After all, the wall which separates Israel from the West Bank is literally called the Hafrada Wall by Israelis, and their leaders have openly supported the principle of separation for decades. But we'll come back to that in a second. While you could say that the racism experienced by Palestinians within Israel isn't quite as extreme as it was in South Africa, what Israel is also guilty of is a brutal military occupation which, in many ways, is worse than apartheid. Or at least, I don't think the apartheid state in South Africa ever had a policy of destroying the houses of entire families because one member was suspected of terrorism, an act which was almost always carried out before trial. Of course, these distinctions are quite pedantic, but it is worth remembering that there will be rhetorical differences between academic work and political advocacy. For example, the historian Ilan Pape will write very inflammatory pieces where he describes the situation in Gaza as an incremental genocide, but it's unlikely there will be many peer-reviewed historical works using that phrase because incremental genocide is not a legal term. But you do need to be careful here because the use of the word apartheid isn't just a rhetorical flourish. Politically and legally, it's used very purposefully. The reason people don't concede to calling it hafrada is because there are very strict international laws surrounding the crime of apartheid, but none which mention the crime of hafrada. So if we want an effective international response to this, the recognition of Israel as an apartheid state is a very significant step. But for making that argument, I'm going to hand you over now to a YouTuber called Beast Process. Beast Process is a Palestinian American creator who makes very detailed videos that mostly focus on Middle Eastern politics. His name is like that because Arabic speakers don't really use the letter P. Um, it reminds me of my dad saying things like bolis or computer. Um, it's funny. Anyway, here he is to tell us why Israel is guilty of apartheid. To understand this debate, we in turn need to understand what Israel is being charged with. Israel is being charged with the crime of apartheid, and since these accusers are human rights organizations, they base this accusation firmly in international law. Thus, apartheid, as it is being discussed here, is not just an analogy being made between apartheid South Africa and Israel, though there are a lot of similarities, but it is also a specific and defined crime. In fact, it is a rather severe crime, as it is considered a crime against humanity. The visceral disgust at the degradation of the people of South Africa at the hands of the system of apartheid was so great that it was found necessary to make apartheid as illegal as possible. Three international treaties cite apartheid as a crime against humanity. Under international law, apartheid is committed when three things occur. 1. 
A system of domination of one racial group over another is instituted. Two, this system is implemented with the intent to maintain that system. And three, when inhumane acts are committed pursuant to those policies in the context of a system of apartheid. So in the case of this debate, what is happening is that Jewish Israelis are being given a position of dominance over Palestinians with the intent of maintaining that position of dominance on the part of Israeli policymakers. And in the context of the system of dominance, inhumane acts are being committed against the Palestinians by the Israeli state and its policymakers. One of you might believe they are being smart by typing, but Israelis and Palestinians are part of the same Semitic race, therefore they are the same racial group, uh, therefore it's not apartheid. But unfortunately for you, the definition of racial discrimination under international law includes nationality and ethnicity. So tough tits, stop typing. And if you're going to go into the comments and you want to argue, but what about XYZ country, feel free to do your own research into whether this definition applies to that situation. If it does or doesn't has no bearing on whether it does concerning Israel. What aboutism is not a counter argument here. Israel's intent towards how it treats Palestinians is best demonstrated by one of its most recent basic laws, the nation-state law of 2018. Now, basic laws are more or less analogous to constitutional amendments in terms of how foundational they are to the law. The nation-state law of 2018 declared that Israel is the state of the Jewish people, that Jews have a unique right to self-determination, and that settlement is a national value. All of these stipulations pretty clearly give Israeli Jews a position of privilege above Palestinians as well as denoting the intent to give Israeli Jews this privilege status. Israel also has two different paths to citizenship for Jews and Palestinians. In order to be a citizen of Israel, you just have to be Jewish. So let's say you are this guy and you were born on Long Island. Look at you. Because he is Jewish, despite having no immediate ancestors that had ever lived in Israel, he can automatically become a citizen of Israel. Palestinians have to prove residency between 1948 and 1952, despite the fact that Palestinians have been living in what is today called Israel centuries before 1948. Why is 1948 the cutoff date? Because that just happens to be the year when all the Palestinians were ethnically cleansed from their homes. It's a very convenient cutoff date. The nation state law and the way the nation state law interprets the citizenship law we just discussed is best described by the nation state law's creator, former prime minister, for now, Benjamin Netanyahu. The nation state law, first of all, entrenches the law of return. It raises it to another level. And this law, of course, grants an automatic right to Jews and only to them to come here and receive citizenship. Without the nation-state law, it will be impossible to ensure for future generations the future of Israel as a Jewish national state. Netanyahu is very explicit that Israel is not a state of all of its citizens, but rather the nation-state of the Jewish people and only them. These sorts of statements indicating the intent of maintaining a Jewish majority at all costs is not unique to Benjamin Netanyahu, but has been a part of the entrenched and long-lasting effects of Israeli decision-making since the inception of the State of Israel. For Jerusalem, Israeli urban planning aims at maintaining a specific ratio of 60% Jews and 40% Palestinians. Since settlement is seen as a national value, the West Bank, which Israeli officials, including the current Prime Minister, insist on calling Judea and Samaria, is also governed with the intent to maintain a system where Jewish Israelis are given a position of dominance above Palestinians. Even the Gaza Strip is governed with the intent to maintain a Jewish majority. Gaza, still being occupied under international law, despite how much Israeli governments insist that it isn't, has been experiencing over a decade of blockade. The blockade began after the withdrawal of Israeli settlers and the subsequent victory of Hamas in his legislative elections in 2007. The withdrawal, far from being a compromise for the sake of peace, was actually portrayed by its policymakers as an issue of demographics. 
As then Prime Minister Ariel Sharon put it, Gaza cannot be held on to forever. Over one million Palestinians live there, and they are doubling their numbers with every generation. His deputy, Shimon Perez, was even more blunt. We are disengaging from Gaza because of demography. This withdrawal, as one of Sharon's aides, Dove Wiseglass put it, is actually formaldehyde. It supplies the amount of formaldehyde that is necessary so that there will not be a political process with the Palestinians. These intentions inform Israeli policy, which is used to make up a system of domination of Jewish Israelis over Palestinians. They do this by implementing a regime of territorial fragmentation, segregation, dispossession of the land, and deprivation of economic and social rights. The Palestinians living in Israel are second-class citizens. Israel heavily discriminates against its Palestinian Arab population through a variety of policies. They are very numerous and deal mostly with land and the allocation of state resources, so they can be a bit mind-numbingly bureaucratic, but nonetheless, it substantially harms the quality of life of Palestinians and is done with the intent of maintaining a system where Jewish Israelis hold a position of dominance over Palestinians. Earlier I mentioned the different methods of citizenship based on laws passed in relation to 1948, but even if Palestinians can become citizens via that act, it doesn't mean that the Israeli government does not continue to expropriate their land. Present absentees were those who were internally displaced by the Nakba, but were not expelled from the country. Israel, under the absentee property law, stole their land also. This absentee property law was also used to steal land from those who were expelled from the country entirely. Despite supposedly being equal citizens of Israel, they cannot reclaim their stolen property, even if it is empty and are forced to settle with recompensation. Though many flatly refuse this and continue to ask for their land back, which they are entitled to, Jews on the other hand can request and regain any property they lost as a result of the 1948 war, even if that land is currently lived on by someone else. About 80% of Palestinian citizens of Israel are packed into the remaining 3 to 3.5% of this land. This isn't an accident. Israel stole land using a British Mandate era law, which took around 1.2 to 1.3 million dunams from Palestinian citizens in Israel for public purposes, which was mostly used in order to advance the settlement of the land. Of all the land taken, 92% was privately owned by the Palestinians. As a result of these expropriations, some 93% of land in Israel and occupied East Jerusalem, comprising around 19.5 million dunams, which is 1.95 million hectares, is now state land. Most of these villages from which Palestinians were expelled remain empty and owned by the state and Palestinians are denied the ability to return to their land and their own country, mainly, as many Israeli officials have made clear, to maintain a demographic majority of Jews vis-a-vis -vis Palestinians. Literally any Jewish person on any corner of this globe can immigrate to Israel, but Palestinians who legally have the right to return to their land are disallowed. You do not even need to be of Jewish descent to have this special privilege, which is denied to Palestinians. Take the story of these South African white Afrikaners who converted to Judaism and then were given the right to move to Israel, some of whom became settlers in the West Bank. Part of the reason that this land is allocated in such a discriminatory manner is the allocation of governmental powers over to organizations that are given a preferential status in Israeli law. The World Zionist Organization and the Jewish National Fund, both organizations that were explicitly founded to advocate for the interests of one ethnic group are delegated a powerful hand in coordinating the use of land. The Israel Land Authority, for instance, which manages Israel's state land, is required to give six out of 14 of its seats to members of the Jewish National Fund. Now, imagine if the US had a white national fund, which was mandated to hold six out of 14 seats of the Department of the Interior. There are also the admissions committees for certain small settlements, which give five member councils of settlements with less than 400 households the ability to decide who gets to live there. 
Out of the five members of these councils, it is mandatory that one of them be a member of the World Zionist Organization, and the committees can deny access to the settlement to anyone based on arbitrary factors like whether or not they are compatible with the social fabric and culture of the community. As you can imagine, this effectively gives Israeli Jews the ability to keep Palestinians out of 695 towns in Israel. Since 1948, Israel has established more than 700 Jewish localities in Israel, whereas it has not established any new locality for Palestinians except for the state-planned Bedouin townships in the Nakab, which are designed for the forced urbanization of Bedouins. The Bedouin have a unique culture and tradition living in the Nakab that has been severely disrupted by Israel's theft of their land and their lack of recognition of their rights. There are over 100 Israeli settlements in the Nakab, and by contrast, Bedouin municipal councils only have jurisdiction over 1.9% of the land, despite being one-fourth of the land's population. Israel arbitrarily decides what can and can't be recognized as a village. 35 Bedouin villages are not recognized as belonging to them, and they are deemed squatters illegally trespassing state land. Naturally, they resist this distinction on the part of the Israelis, and some have decided to attempt to rebuild their villages. Emphasis on attempt. Consider the case of the village of Arakib. In 1948, villagers were told to leave their villages by the Israeli military under the pretense that it would be temporary. It wasn't, and instead it was declared a military zone. All land claims by the villagers were rejected. They have resorted to building against the permission of the Israeli state. Whatever they build, Israel destroys. The Israelis have destroyed their attempts to rebuild their villages about 186 times, all to enforce the theft of their land. This is not so much systemic racism as it is plainly Jim Crow. The Palestinians in Israel aren't just dealing with the unwillingness of present administrations to undo the damages of past policies, but rather they are still being harmed by policies maintained in the present. Palestinians in East Jerusalem, which Israel illegally annexed, are treated as non-citizens and are thus only provided residency status. Palestinians in East Jerusalem refuse citizenship for a country that illegally annexed their city they have been living in for centuries and are thus subject to Israeli law without representation. Palestinians are subject to having their residency removed if they cannot prove they are centered in the city. Israelis in East Jerusalem do not have to be worried about losing residency for any reason, despite many of them living in illegal settlements as part of a broader illegal annexation of the city. Between 1967 and 2020, this has resulted in 14,701 Palestinians losing residency status. East Jerusalem is home to 225,178 illegal settlers, all of whom get preferential treatment in the allocation of the city's resources. The settlements are illegal, and in many cases are built with the same methods of expropriation as was previously mentioned. This makes it so that in East Jerusalem, where Palestinians are 60% of the population, they are only given 15% of the land designated to them for residence by Israeli planners. From 1991 to 2018, Israeli authorities approved applications for 9,536 building permits for Palestinians in East Jerusalem. 16.5% of the 57,737 applications for building permits approved in Jerusalem, compared to 21,834 applications for permits for settlements in East Jerusalem. This forces Palestinians who want to continue to live in East Jerusalem to build without a permit, which often results in Israelis destroying their home. It's a sort of catch-22, where the Israelis make it so difficult to get a permit and then destroy any home built without a permit. Israel's apartheid wall, as it is called by Palestinians, has made it so that neighborhoods within the Jerusalem municipal boundary are on the other side of the wall. This cuts off 100,000 people from parts of the city they live in, requiring them to go through checkpoints. Despite Palestinians being 38% of the population of Jerusalem, in the whole municipality, they only receive about 10% of state funding. 
in areas such as health, education, and other services that can only be provided by the state, there is a clear disparity in the allocation of resources. The inevitable outcome of this is that it encourages Palestinians to leave the city, which conveniently results in the achievement of the goal of maintaining a ratio of 60% Jews and 40% Palestinians. Now, let's discuss the West Bank, where I feel that the seizure of land for the purpose of maintaining a regime of apartheid shouldn't be that much of a hard pill to swallow for you guys. Palestinians in the West Bank are subject to the governance of Israel's military and have zero voice in how they are governed by Israel. Settling in the West Bank is illegal. The West Bank is occupied land, and that does not belong to Israel. But despite this, all Israeli settlers in the West Bank have all the perks of Israeli citizenship. They enjoy the connection to the infrastructure and services of the Israeli state, such as highways exclusive to them, while living in the West Bank where none of those privileges are afforded to Palestinians. In the West Bank, excluding East Jerusalem, there are 441,600 settlers. Palestinians from the West Bank, who were expelled in 1967, there was an expulsion during that war as well, also are barred from returning to their homes in the West Bank. Israel also controls the demographics of the West Bank and Gaza through its control of the population registry, which it obtained control over after 1967. This basically is how Palestinians prove things like whether they live there or not, if they have the ability to leave and come back, changes of address and birth and death certificates. In 1995, these powers were supposedly given to the Palestinian Authority, but requests concerning the population registry must first go through Israel. Israel has used this control to strike 140,000 West Bankers and 108,000 Gazans from the population registry. This also causes many issues for people with spouses who are not a part of the population registry, or people who, according to the population registry, are from Gaza, but have been living in the West Bank for years, and vice versa. Israel controls these people's status at a whim, and this often causes instances of family separation and isolation. People are forced to become undocumented in their own country because of Israel. Area C is home to around 300,000 Palestinians, in addition to almost all of the 441,600 Israeli settlers living in the occupied West Bank. However, Israeli authorities have allocated 70% of the land in Area C to settlements and less than 1% to Palestinians. In practice, Palestinians are only allowed to build on about 0.5% of Area C, most of which is already built up. In 1971, Military Order 418 deprived Palestinians decision-making powers by getting rid of the indigenous planning committees. They gave these powers to the Civil Administration's Higher Planning Council, which is made up by Israeli government officials and settler organizations. Palestinians do not have a say in the planning or use of the land in Area C at all. Israelis also selectively use the legal soup of the overlapping Jordanian, British, and Ottoman laws in order to make building as difficult as possible for Palestinians. They use British Mandate era planning outlines from the 40s to make decisions on municipal planning in 2022. The, the Israeli Civil Administration approved just 21 of the 1,485 Palestinian applications for building permits in Area C between 2016 and 2018. Israel's army also maintains control over the access to water in the West Bank, where they make it so that you must attain a permit in order to build a well. If you have been paying attention to what has been discussed so far, these permits are insanely difficult to obtain. As a result, 93% of Palestinian land in 2017 was not irrigated. Israelis, on the other hand, have almost unfettered access to Palestinians' water. 82% of the West Bank's groundwater is transferred to Israel and its settlements. Palestinians have to get over 50% of their own water from Israel. As a result, Palestinians on average use only 70 liters of water a day, and Israeli settlers consume 369 liters. Israel's permit and checkpoint regime also serves the maintenance of the system of apartheid via the fragmentation of Palestinian society. If you are a Palestinian in any part of your country, you need a permit to visit East Jerusalem, Gaza, or the West Bank. In the West Bank, in order to enter an Israeli settlement, you need a permit, and you can only do so as a worker. 
If you live in the parts of the West Bank which are isolated by the wall, in order to access your land, you need a permit. Palestinians are barred from traveling to other parts of their own country without a permit due to these settlements. 80% of those who have land on the other side of this wall cannot access it. The wall is illegally built on land that Israel has no legal claim to at all in order to protect settlements which are also themselves illegal. Israeli settlers have the ability to freely move about the West Bank and employ a system of exclusive roads for this purpose. In the case of the city of Khalil, some of these exclusive roads are within the city and cause Palestinian life to be fragmented, even in huge urban centers. Today, Israeli settlements cover nearly 10% of the West Bank, and their regional councils have jurisdiction over 1.65 million dunams of land in Area C, roughly 63% of Area C, or 40% of the West Bank, where most settlers live. As mentioned earlier, Gaza, despite being supposedly disengaged, is still subject to Israel's permit regime and is at the whim of its control of its population registry. But Israel also controls Gaza in other ways. It controls Gaza's airspace and its maritime borders, within which there is a considerable amount of natural gas. Israel also maintains control within the Gaza Strip via its buffer zone, which extends to a distance between 300 meters and 1500 meters from the fence, roughly 17% of the total area of the Gaza Strip. It extends over 35% of the agricultural land in Gaza. Meanwhile, the access-restricted maritime area covers 85% of its fishing waters. In a supreme act of cruelty, Israel denies Palestinians of their farmland by shooting anyone who gets close to the buffer zone, and they periodically spray herbicide via drones over this land. It is estimated that between 2010 and 2017, 161 Palestinians were shot by approaching this buffer zone and over 3,000 were injured. All of this separates over 100,000 farmers from their land. All of these policies that I mentioned are really only part of the problem. I could not possibly list each and every single one of them because they are simply too numerous for the confines of what was planned to be a relatively short video essay. If you want to understand the totality of this system, I encourage you to read the report yourself, though I warn you, it is exhausting. It looks pretty clear that the first two points are covered concerning the intent and the system of domination. Now that we've discussed the policies that Israel uses to implement its system of domination over Palestinians, it is now time to discuss whether Israel does in fact commit inhumane acts against Palestinians. The forcible transfer of a population is a crime against humanity and an inhumane act. When people are forced to leave places in which they have the right to live in for reasons that are not accepted under international law, this is forcible transfer. Even just by creating adverse living conditions in which those who are targeted cannot live in their land can constitute the crime of forcible transfer. Israel's planning and building regime has often resulted in the forcible transfer of Palestinian families and has forced Palestinians to live in small enclaves. Israel has been destroying villages and forcing Palestinians out of them since 1948. Forced displacements in Silwan, Sheikh Jarrah, and Masafariyata are all examples of this type of forcible transfer. Prisoners, including children, are also forcibly transferred to prisons inside Israel, which is super illegal under international law. Administrative detentions are arrests and detainments that occur with no charge, no due process, and which could potentially be maintained indefinitely. They are based on secret evidence and are done for security reasons. Palestinians have the right to appeal these detentions, but as mentioned, they and their lawyers do not have access to what the actual charges being raised against them even are. Under international law, these sorts of detentions can only occur under very specific and stringent circumstances when it is absolutely necessary for the security of the detaining power. As you can imagine, Israel uses this in such a systematic way that it cannot possibly be understood as being done entirely for security reasons. Detainees often do not know when they will be released due to Israel's ability to extend these detentions indefinitely. But besides the psychological torment involved in imprisonment, there is also the physical torment of torture, which has been reported on consistently since the beginning of Israel's occupation of Palestine. Palestinians have been beaten, painfully shackled, 
face sleep deprivation, sexual harassment, extensive use of solitary confinement, and have been placed in what are called stress positions. One such stress position is cruelly referred to as the Palestinian chair, a technique which Israelis taught Americans to employ in America's occupation of Iraq and was a method used in Abu Ghraib. These sorts of abuses are not only inflicted upon adults, but also children. Israel regularly detains children under administrative detention. By June 2020, there are at least 151 children detained by Israel. Under international law, you can't just kill people. That might be a shocker for some, but yeah, that's how it be. Between 2000 and 2017, Israel killed 4,868 Palestinians in the occupied territories, including 1,793 children outside of the context of a war. During protests, border crossings, checkpoints, and almost all other types of interactions that Palestinians have with Israel's armed presence in the occupied territories, Palestinians have been killed by Israeli forces. In the aftermath of these attacks, Israeli forces often prevent the arrival of medical personnel that could potentially save the life of those who have been gravely injured. The greatest mass killing of Palestinians outside of the context of a war is almost certainly the Great March of Return of 2018, a protest in Gaza near the Israeli-imposed buffer zone on which Palestinians protested against the blockade and for their right to return to their homes after being denied this right for 70 plus years. Beginning in 2018 and ending in 2019, the Israelis killed 214 civilians, including 46 children using live ammunition. Even medics and journalists were not spared, most notably in the case of the death of Razan al Najar and maiming of Adham al Hajar. As previously mentioned, I could not possibly go into every policy. There is a lot I left out for the sake of brevity, so I really do encourage that you read these reports if you can. It is important that those of us who live in the West and who are free to act without restrictions, unlike the Palestinians, that we do something about spreading awareness of this issue and turning that awareness into meaningful action. And with that said, I am done hijacking this man's channel with my Palestinian ways, and I will allow this lie Lebanese man to talk about what we can do. Also, go follow my channel, please. Yes, you should subscribe to his channel. Pause the video and do it now. Why wouldn't you? You idiot. You f Okay, so now that we've gone through all that, I'm sure a lot of you are wondering, what can I do about that? And at first glance, it looks like a really difficult question to answer. Palestinians have grown fairly accustomed to disappointment from their domestic and international partners from their history of being frequently let down by allies in the surrounding Arab countries, the corrupt multi-millionaires leading Fatah and the West Bank, Hamas and the Gaza Strip, the fruitless and destructive partisanship between their own political leaders, their list of friends has always been fairly slim. One of the things that makes the apartheid comparison so important is that it emphasizes the role of other countries around the world. Israel owes its dominance to the support it receives from the international community, and Palestinian failure is largely owed to a lack thereof. Just as it was in South Africa, the attitudes of our own governments are crucial to what happens over there. Going with the fact that most of you are probably from somewhere in Europe or North America, we should talk about the kind of things that can be done in our own countries. Because based on my own limited experience, activism in Western countries really isn't as difficult as you might think. The first step is to know what you're advocating for. In recent years, support for the famous two-state solution of sovereign nations based on the 1967 borders has become increasingly unpopular, with many arguing that the expansion of settlements in the West Bank has made it impossible. Last month, a poll came out showing that opposition to the two-state solution has now grown to an all-time high of 69%. At the same time, support for the one-state solution with equal rights for Jews and Palestinians has been surging in the past year. However, the numbers here have also been inconsistent, with neither option seeming to establish a clear majority. And then there's the question of what exactly a one-state solution means. Whether it means a bi-national state for Jews and Arabs, a Palestinian-Israeli confederation, 
These are all interesting questions, but for most of us, I don't really think this is the best thing to focus on. As advocates from the other side of the world, there isn't much use in picking teams from a group of people that doesn't really seem to agree on much at all, especially when their rights are being violated in ways that most international bodies would agree is unacceptable. Or as the campaigner and NGO founder Jamal Juma put it, it was impossible for the movement to adopt in its discourse a political solution based on the two-state or the one-state solution because the Palestinian people do not agree on either of them. The Palestinian issue is one of rights, against the injustices and violations they are subjected to. Realizing absolute justice for our people, given the context of the historical injustice that has befallen them, does not seem possible in the near future. Therefore, talking about one or two states becomes a political luxury and privilege in light of the great imbalance of power in favor of the colonizer that is using the most advanced modern technology to subdue, oppress, and displace the colonized. Now, that isn't to say there isn't any value in talking about one or two states, but personally, I think we can only spend so long sitting in a fog of cigar smoke discussing borders and partition plans like the English bastards who started this whole thing in the first place. Instead, I think a much more useful and simple approach would just be to listen to Palestinians. Look at what their more immediate demands are and encourage our own politicians to take note. Of course, we've already pointed out how Palestinians are far from being a monolith. Opinions and narratives will vary between people who live in Gaza, the West Bank, East Jerusalem, the Palestinians who live within Israel, the millions of people living as refugees stranded in Jordan or Lebanon, often only a short drive away from their old homes. But despite all of that fracturing, there is still a surprising amount of common ground. One commentator suggested that the protests which swept the entire country last year were the most uniform display of resistance since 1948. The idea of a collective Palestinian consciousness is still very much alive, and their immediate demands have managed to stay consistent. When asked about their most vital national goals, Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank gave a pretty clear answer as to what their top priorities are. The first was ending the occupation, or in other words, the Israeli withdrawal to the 1967 borders. Just a quick bit of background. The Six-Day War in 1967 ended with Israel seizing the Gaza Strip, the West Bank and East Jerusalem, as well as the Sinai Peninsula in Egypt and the Golan Heights in Syria. Over half a million Arabs were displaced and the rest were brought under Israeli control. Later that year, the UN Security Council adopted Resolution 242, which called for withdrawal of Israeli armed forces from territories occupied in the recent conflict. They infamously omitted one very important word before the word territories, which gave Israel a good bit of room for interpretation. They withdrew from the Sinai in 1979 and, um, yeah. To this day, the occupying forces in the West Bank and East Jerusalem are still there. And despite pulling out of Gaza in 2005, Israel still has control over the air and maritime spaces and control over the border which looks like this, by the way. This ongoing occupation, including the expansion of settlements into the West Bank and the denial of Palestinian self-determination are all unambiguously illegal and opposing them should be a no-brainer. Now, in case you notice that second part about a Palestinian state and are thinking, well, isn't that kind of like a two-state solution? Well, first of all, well spotted, but also no. Long story short, a two-state solution and two states are not quite the same thing, but that's probably for a different video. The second demand is the right of return. This one might need a bit more background. The State of Israel was born in 1948 during the Arab-Israeli War. That year, in an event known as the Nakba, Arabic for catastrophe, over 500 Palestinian villages were ethnically cleansed by Israeli military forces. At least a few dozen of those clearances ended in massacres, and the other 750,000 survivors were either squashed into Gaza and the West Bank, or pushed into refugee camps in Jordan, Syria and Lebanon. Most of these refugees ended up living just a couple of hours away from their old villages. Many of them still have the keys to their houses and their original land documents. 
On the year of the Nakba, the UN General Assembly adopted a resolution stating that refugees wishing to return to their homes and live at peace with their neighbors should be allowed to do so at the earliest practicable date. But despite the resolution being reaffirmed over a hundred times, the refugees of 1948 and their descendants have been denied the right of return. Incidentally, this denial is also explicitly listed as one of the inhumane acts in the International Convention on Apartheid. Why is Israel denying this right? Well, broadly speaking, I can think of two reasons. The first, to put it bluntly, is just racism. The current regime in Israel wants to exist as a Jewish ethnic majority with as few Palestinians living there as possible. Within the country, the events of 1948 have been aggressively whitewashed. Instead of the Nakba, they call it the War of Independence. They have a counter-narrative that either downplays or denies the event, and historians have had to spend decades showing how the Nakba wasn't just an ethnic cleansing, but that it was also calculated and planned in advance. Just this year, a documentary called Tantura revived a previously discredited story about a village where over 200 people were shot and buried in a mass grave. Unfortunately, a big part of Israel's refusal to recognize the right of return is because their version of the story denies that any such right exists at all. Now, there is another objection that I think can be taken in good faith. As many Palestinians will even argue, the Nakba never really ended. There were around three quarters of a million displaced Palestinians in 1948. Today, there are over seven million. Meanwhile, the populations in Israel and Palestine have also grown quite a bit. Even if you support the right of return in principle, you might stop to ask the practical question, where would they go? Are we gonna squeeze 20 million people into a space smaller than Belgium? Wouldn't a lot of the Jews currently living in Israel have to leave? What if they don't want to? Would the solution then be just to have ethnic cleansing but the other way around? To which some people might say, yes, they're colonizers, they're living on stolen land, can yeet them, etc. And the problem with that is that it's effectively just another side of the same coin. It's just another way of treating the right of return as a zero-sum game that can only be achieved through an obscene level of violence. And that just isn't the case. Let's have a look at this map. Those red dots are the 100 or so villages that were depopulated and built over by new settlements. The green dots are the ones that remain standing, but those yellow ones are just under 400 villages that were ethnically cleansed in 1948 and then abandoned. To this day, those areas are still empty. Palestinian scholars and activists have been thinking about this question for a very long time. They understand that you can't just unwind history the other way, and thanks to them, with an honorable mention to the UN, the status of just about every refugee since 1948 is extremely well documented. There are records of where they came from, where they are now, and ownership records that show their connection to the land. We know that half of them live within 40 kilometers of their old communities, and that many of them can still see their old homes from the opposite hill. Thanks to the work of scholars like Salman Abu Sita, we even have urban development proposals for integrating refugees into the areas that were built over. We know that even if all 7 million refugees made it back home, the population density would be just a little higher than that of Barbados and a fraction of that of places like Singapore or Bahrain. And we also have this very cheeky suggestion about how this could all be paid for especially given that ending the occupation would free a lot of that um, military aid expenditure. Worth noting, I like that. Hey, um, I had actually just finished editing this video and then a Jewish member of my community sent me this article which I thought was just really, really apt for this section. So I'm just kind of throwing this in after the fact because I'm professional. A lot of people will say that when Israelis reject the right of return, they're really just doing it out of a kind of settler mentality. I don't think that's completely untrue, but it definitely doesn't tell the whole story. To show you what I mean by that, I'm just going to read this part out because I think it says it better than I could. Why do many Jews fight so hard against the right to return? 
The fact that many Jews fiercely oppose the Palestinian right to return and the related vision of a peaceful binational state befuddles many activists, who see a shared democracy where both Jews and Palestinians receive respect as one of the most hopeful and just solutions imaginable. But, along with Israel's denials of its responsibility for the refugee crisis, there is a second and deeper issue involved. Jews have had convincing experiences that lacking a place to run can have life or death consequences. In 1938, 32 nations met in um, France to discuss whether to allow European Jews desperate to flee the Nazis into their countries. 31 of them, all but the Dominican Republic, refused. Evian was an awful culmination of centuries of Jews' attempts to flee forced conversion, violence, and expulsion, to which Jews were vulnerable partly because, as a small diaspora, they were minorities in every place, at the mercy of elites. Many fear that if Palestinians achieve return inside Israel's 1948 borders, win true democratic rights and grow to be a majority, it might end Jewish control over immigration to Israel, which many see as their safeguard in case of an anti-Jewish resurgence. No matter how frightening a physical implementation of return may sound, Jews must take the fundamental step to acknowledge Palestinians' human right to return. I think that last line is really essential. The concerns she describes are definitely more understandable than anything that could have been voiced by the Afrikaners in South Africa. It isn't even to mention the very real issue of anti-Semitism in the Middle East that existed long before the State of Israel was formed and still persists today in the likes of Hamas and Hezbollah. But I would also argue that groups like this do, at least partially, owe their success to decades of Israeli aggression and to some dubious divide-and-conquer tactics by a certain Israeli governor. The fear of anti-Semitism should never be swept under the rug, but it also can't serve as a reason to justify an eternal cycle of human rights violations. The idea of continuing to oppress innocent people today on the basis that they might end up oppressing us tomorrow is not an ethical position we would take anywhere else, and it shouldn't be taken here either. So those are two demands, and hopefully I've given you a good idea of how to responsibly defend them. The next question is, what do? The first and most obvious thing is something called BDS, standing for Boycotts, Divestments and Sanctions. This is largely based on the strategies of the anti-apartheid movement, which involved boycotts of consumer products, sports teams refusing to compete, academic boycotts by universities, and eventually economic sanctions from governments. Campaigns like this have already been shown to have an effect in Israel, particularly in the settlements. In 2014, an official in the Jordan Valley admitted that their income had been severely damaged, mostly because supermarkets in Western Europe were refusing to sell their produce. If you want a couple of familiar examples, Sabra Hummus produced in Israel is part of a joint venture with the Strauss Group, which gives aid to the Golani Brigade of the Israeli military, and HP, the computers, not the condiments, have had a history of providing data security services for the Israeli administration of border crossings. This means they've had a direct hand in upholding the checkpoint system which severely limits Palestinian movement. It's useful to have this kind of information because when you're an activist, you're very likely to come across opposition. If you want to join a student organization to push an academic boycott, but you go to a university that's full of conservatives like I did, then it might be worth looking into exactly which institutions your university is tied to. For example, it's much harder to argue for a boycott of the multicultural University of Haifa than it is to target somewhere like Bar Ilan, which works directly with the IDF to develop unmanned combat vehicles. Depending on where you are, it does help to be realistic, and knowing these kind of details can be incredibly valuable. Now, unfortunately, in the US, where this activism would be the most effective, many states are introducing anti-BDS legislation. Whether or not that's even constitutional, I doubt anyone could reasonably say that Americans shouldn't have the ability to boycott regimes. This is where Palestine Legal comes in. It's a non-profit that offers legal advice to Palestinian advocacy groups, as well as challenging anti-BDS legislation. If you were interested in donating to an organization, I would definitely recommend this one. At the moment, they're involved in a lawsuit against Texas where legislators are denying state contracts to companies that support BDS. Which is bad, so 
Link in the description. Another thing you can do, especially if you don't have the time to get involved in local action, is to f***ing vote, you idiot. Now, don't worry. This is not an endorsement of Joe Biden or, God forbid, Keir Starmer. I would never. For one, Biden's approach to Israel and Palestine has been fairly underwhelming. His administration has been uniquely quiet on the issue, and he seems to have avoided making any detailed prescriptions. However, I would still argue that Biden would not have gone as far as his predecessor who overturned decades of US policy by recognizing the right of Israel to annex parts of the West Bank. This proposal, which was drawn up in Trump's Israeli-Palestinian um, peace plan, was opposed by most Democrat leaders before it was frozen in 2020. Looking at recent developments, there is still a worrying chance that a Likud majority in Israel and a Republican presidency in 2024 could lead to this plan being implemented. I don't want to go off on a tangent about that, but suffice to say it will be very bad. For all Biden's flaws, Trump was a special case when it came to Israel, even by US standards. People like Biden and Starmer may have weak positions on Israel and Palestine, but that doesn't mean they have to. Just this year, possibly for the first time ever, Democrats and Dem-leading independents were shown to have more favorable views towards the Palestinian people and government than they had towards Israelis. When you see that development contrasted with the other side where a third of the increasingly vocal American evangelicals think the entire country should belong to a single Israeli government, it does take an exceptional amount of privilege not to spot the difference between these two sides. As for our brick-shaped talking head in the UK, his views are already standing at odds with his party members who have been much more vocal against Israel than he has. Of course, the best way to convince politicians to change their tune is to make them. In 1986, Ronald Reagan infamously tried to veto a set of sanctions against South Africa, but was ultimately overridden by an overwhelming vote in the Senate. The public pressure against the apartheid regime was so strong that even a good number of Republicans didn't want to take on the burden of supporting a pariah state. Who knows, maybe with enough persuasion, even this guy could make a comeback. We must not become part of South Africa's problem. We must remain part of their solution. We must not aim to impose ourselves, our solutions, our favorites in South Africa. Damn it, we have favorites in South Africa. The favorites in South Africa are the people who are being repressed by that ugly white regime. We have favorites. Our loyalty is not to South Africa, it's to South Africans. And the South Africans are majority black and they are being excoriated. It is not to some stupid puppet government over there. It is not to the Afrikaners regime. We have no loyalty to them. We have no loyalty to South Africa, to South Africans. And the fact of the matter is we, I mean, I listen to this rationale first of all. It is the leaders of South Africa and their people, black and white, who have the majority responsibility. They must rise to it. Well, they are rising to it. They're rising to it. The only thing left available to them with that repulsive repugnant regime of Afrikaners there. And it's the only way they have. They've tried everything for the last 20 years. They begged, they borrowed, they crawled, and now they're taking up arms. I think a good thing to remember here is that politicians are not leaders. A lot of them will just happily go in whatever direction they think the public is going. Whether or not they do that on our side of the world is really up to us. It's one thing to know that an unprecedented number of people are favoring Palestinians in their answers to survey questions. The next step is to demonstrate that. There's a famous quote that gets passed around online, which may or may not be authentic, but it does seem to capture the intent of the Israeli regime just after 1948. It simply goes, the old will die and the young will forget. Clearly, the young have not forgotten, not over there or over here. And I think that's an encouraging thought. Right. F*** off. <laughs>